In this video, I'm going to design and build this futuristic looking RC boat that flies through the water. In the previous video of this project, I collaborated with Tomasz, who is an electrical engineer from Hungary. We spent two years developing these liquid level sensing hydrofoil masts for RC hydrofoiling boats. If you missed that video, you should definitely go check it out because it shows exactly how these things work and walks you through the whole development process. But in that video, I only got as far as testing them on this basic flat bottomed airboat that is just made out of a flat sheet of foam. Not very impressive, but it did work well enough to use as a test platform for developing these foils. In this video, I'm going to try and design and build a higher performance hull that people can copy if they want to buy the PCB hydrofoil kit and make their own boat. Step one was to hop into Onshape and design this fancier hull that can be 3D printed. It's got steps in the bottom kind of like seaplane floats, so that it can break free from the water's surface more easily as it rises up. The old one had trouble breaking free from the water's surface due to the flat bottom, and that's the reason why I had to aim the motor up so much. It would blow air underneath the hull to break free from the surface tension kind of like a hovercraft. I 3D printed this new hull in 8 sections using lightweight PLA. I chose the foaming lightweight filament because at this point I still wasn't quite sure how much weight these foils would be able to carry, and I wanted to be on the safe side. Each section got glued together with Gorilla Glue. I added 3mm carbon fiber rods in between each section to keep them perfectly aligned and add a little strength. The PCB foils will mount onto these red pieces printed out of PETG. Those get sandwiched in between the hull sections to lock them in place. And the rudder foil gets attached to this rear mount that also slots in between the two hull sections, with the help of some carbon fiber tubes to secure it in place. I'm having the foils interface with these red PETG parts instead of the lightweight PLA because the lightweight PLA is relatively weak. And we're going to need to seal it from water ingress, which would be a lot harder if there were bolt holes in it. Quick side note about the foil layout. When I was testing the prototypes at the lake, this random kid kept telling me my boat was driving backwards. So that makes me think some people might wonder why I designed it like this, with two foils in the front and one in the back, rather than one in the front and two in the back, like some other foiling boats. But before we get into that, we first have to understand what each foil assembly is and how it works. Each mast PCB senses the water level and controls a servo position based on the water level measurement. That servo is then connected to the mast, so its movement controls the angle of attack of the hydrofoil under the water. If the foil is too deep, the servo increases the angle of attack to increase lift and it rises up. If the foil is too close to the surface, the servo decreases the angle of attack to decrease lift and that brings it down. If the control system is doing its job, the water level should always stay around this dashed line in the center. We need this active height control system because these kinds of fully submerged T-foils are not self-stabilizing. They need some sort of control system to keep the boat at the right height above the water. Whether that be a mechanical linkage like these little foiling sailboats use, or multiple sonar sensors like these fancy foiling boats have. It's all the same idea. They both need a little help from a control system of some sort to keep the boat at the right height above the water. There are types of hydrofoils that are passively stable and don't require any height control system, but these are generally surface piercing foils, and they're usually a little less efficient and more prone to ventilation. So the reason why I chose a tri-foil layout with two actively controlled foils in the front and one non-stabilized foil in the back is because it's the simplest configuration that still provides the boat with stabilization on all axes. Each front foil is responsible only for maintaining its own ride height, but when both front foils do this simultaneously, their combined effect automatically stabilizes the boat in pitch, roll, and height. It's great! The rear foil's angle of attack doesn't change, but I do still have a pushrod connected to it so the angle of attack can be manually fine-tuned by turning these clevises. The whole rudder foil assembly does pivot left and right for steering. I have tested this boat with three actively stabilizing foils, but it didn't work very well. If the rear foil is programmed to respond to the water level in the same way as the front foils, it's going to have an adverse effect on the pitch of the boat. When only the front foils are controlling the altitude, they have a proverse effect on the pitch, since they are ahead of the center of gravity. For example, if the front foil raises the nose, this also increases the pitch of the rear foil, which raises the tail. In contrast, if the rear foil is actively controlled and tries to go up, it's going to pitch the hull down, which will make the boat nosedive. And then the front foils will have to try and compensate. In my experiment, when the rear foil was active, it definitely seemed like the front and rear foils were kind of fighting against each other for pitch control. I think a tri-foil configuration with one static foil on the front and two active foils on the back could potentially be made to work, but the water level measurement for altitude control would need to be measured at the front foil, and then that signal would need to be somehow mixed with the rear servo so that they can do both roll and altitude control. So it would definitely be a lot more complex than just having the two active foils in the front. That's by far the best layout in my opinion. Okay, back to the build. The next thing I did was spackle over all the cracks and rough spots. Usually I would have used epoxy-based fairing compound for this since spackle is not waterproof, 
but my hope was that the next step would prevent water from ever coming into contact with the spackle. First I sanded the spackle down and then painted the whole thing in one part polyurethane paint. This should smooth out all the 3D printed layer lines and form a nice waterproof barrier. Next I screwed on the foil masts, screwed in the servos, attached a drone motor, and headed out to the lake for the first test. All right, first time with this hole in the water. No idea if it's gonna work at all, but let's give it a try. I don't think there's been a single project in the last few years that I haven't used M3 screws for. And I've definitely wasted a ton of time turning these hex drivers by hand. Until today, thanks to Fantic, who is the sponsor of today's video. This Fantic E2 Ultra Screwdriver has become part of my daily toolkit because it's just that useful. The head spins at 270 RPM, so it's much faster than turning screws by hand. My favorite part is that this thing doubles as a torque wrench. There are five torque settings that ensures you'll never strip screws. There's even a cool gradient indicator bar in the screwdriver that shows how much torque it's outputting. The set includes 12 different types and a total of 50 high strength S2 steel precision bits, so you can take on any project. It also comes with a pry bar and ESD tweezers for easy repair of small items, which can meet the disassembly needs of various electronic devices. It charges via USB-C and contains an 800 milliamp hour battery that lasts quite a while. These are definitely the most high-tech powered screwdrivers I've ever seen. Check this out. Boom. There it is. Pull this sucker out and you've got all your tools right there. And it even spins like a revolver. Fantic also makes the F2 Master mini rotary tool. It comes with a bunch of different tool heads for grinding, polishing, drilling, carving, and more. It also charges via USB-C and contains a 700 milliamp hour battery. Having a cordless rotary tool is so much more convenient. I took mine to the lake with me and it came in handy when I needed to drain the water out of this 3D printed boat hull. And oh by the way, it happens to be weather resistant and dust proof, which is super nice. Its small size and lightweight makes it feel like you're just holding a pen. Right now you can get these tools on Amazon for up to 45% off. Use the promo codes in the description of this video and click on the links to take you to the Amazon store pages. Now back to the hydrofoils. The floats, that's a start. This also happens to be my first time testing out the PCB foils from the production batch. A few hundred of these kits had arrived from the factory ready for sale. Upon throttling up, it became clear that this thing was really not as eager to get up on foil as the original prototype was. I couldn't tell if it was just because of the hull design or if the foils were misbehaving. It also could have been because the two front foils were too close together, or even just because it was a bit heavier than the previous prototype. Well now it works, hell. I eventually tried hand launching it and that actually kind of worked. It managed <laughs> to stay up on foil for a few seconds. But while it was up on foil, it didn't seem quite as stable as the prototype, so I was getting suspicious that something else was wrong. After observing the servo movement more closely, I realized the slave unit would occasionally lose the smooth proportional response. It was like the P gain would randomly get turned up to infinity. This did indeed end up being a bug in the production code that the factory had uploaded to hundreds of masts, so that was a huge bummer. I spent a few weeks sending videos and emails back and forth with Tomash trying to figure out this bug and we weren't having much luck. Eventually, he discovered that the slave device thought that the master device would keep sending new parameter sets even though it didn't, and this was indeed making the proportional gain go to infinity. After a band-aid fix, it was back to the lake. The boat was still kind of having issues getting up on foil. It would always start to roll over to the side, but once it did get up on foil, it was working so much better than it was before. It seemed just as stable as the initial prototype, despite the narrower foil base and increased weight. So that's great news. The hydrofoil PCBs were taking care of all the pitch, roll, and height stabilization for me, so all I had to do was control the throttle and rudder, just like a normal RC boat. I think the reason why it would sometimes try to roll over while getting up on foil was because of the V-shaped hull. There's a lot of buoyancy down low, but the center of gravity is up high, so when the foils start to lift out of the water even just a little bit, the hull becomes unstable and starts to roll over before the foils even have a chance to correct. So yeah, this is just kind of a bad hull design. In hindsight, I probably should have made it more like a shallow catamaran hull shape. But other than that one issue, it was working pretty great. This thing is pretty cool, man. This thing is sick. <laughs> I like it. Now that it was working well, it was time to build this body enclosure so that it looks cool. By the way, if you want to access any of these CAD files, they're all available at the Onshape link in the description. Down here in the tabs of this Onshape document, you'll find this boat, as well as all sorts of other different foil mounts I've designed for various other boats. They are all designed to accommodate these 17 gram servos, so if you want to build any of this stuff, you should probably get some of them. Anyhow, I printed the body shells in eight sections out of transparent PETG. The organic supports were really helpful for holding all the thin walls up while printing. The propeller is half concealed in the body, so I'm going to need to cut some holes for it to suck air through. To cut holes, I'm using this ultrasonic knife. 
This was my first time using one of these things, and it turns out they work really well for cutting through plastic. Up close, it kind of looks like the blade is melting through the plastic, but when you feel it, it's not even warm. Pretty cool. I also had to cut out a big slot for the propeller itself to fit through. After cutting out a bunch of wall pieces, it was time to start gluing all the shell sections together. For that, I just used normal CA and a bunch of clamps. A few of the sections had short little carbon tubes in between them for alignment. The windows are another good opportunity to increase airflow to the prop, so they came out too. I glued a bunch of magnets into the hull and the shell so that the two halves just snapped together. Oh, so satisfying and secure. Okay, first test with the shell on here. I hope it's still able to foil with all the added weight. My fear is that the propeller is just gonna suffocate with that shell on there. <laughs> it's definitely louder. <laughs> it still had the roll stability issue while trying to get up on foil, but with a little luck, it could get up on its own. And then once up on foil, the additional weight of the shell didn't seem to make much of a difference in performance, which was great. The addition of the shell makes it look pretty cool in my opinion, but it definitely kind of suffocates the propeller a bit, which reduces efficiency. It kind of inadvertently ended up looking like Thunderbird 2 a little bit, so that's cool. When I designed this boat, the intention was for it to be offered as the main thing that people could build when they buy the PCB hydrofoil kit. But due to the roll stability issue, I would not recommend people copy this design. Actually, in hindsight, I think the roll stability issue could possibly be solved by reducing the angle of attack of the front foils while fully submerged, and by making sure they're perfectly symmetrical, but anyhow, I still think this whole design is a bit suboptimal. In the next episode of this project, I will be designing a new platform that will be more stable and easier to build. So that will be the recommended boat that people can build when they buy the kit. I'll also be making a detailed build tutorial for the new boat, as well as an instructional video showing how to set up and tune the PCB hydrofoils. These kits are currently available for sale, but do be aware of that software bug in the firmware. You'll most likely want to update the firmware on both hydrofoil masts when you receive them, but you don't have to. I made a whole video explaining that, so be sure to watch it if you're interested in getting some of these things. Speaking of getting things, the color shadow lamp is still for sale, and it would make a... Oh, it's driving itself, <laughs> and it's about to hit the dock. <laughs> I gotta stop it. Ooh. Just in time. <laughs> I just had it trimmed to go in circles while I filmed it. Speaking of getting things, the color shadow lamp is still for sale and it would make a great Christmas gift. It hasn't sold out quite yet. There are still a limited number in stock. It uses the same microcontroller as these hydrofoil masts. So that's kind of neat. You can check it out at the link in the description. And there's a link to the hydrofoil kit down there too. I'm gonna see if this whole design works better with no foils. Or I guess just one foil, but I don't think the foil in the back has positive angle of attack, so it shouldn't lift the back up at all. Ooh, yeah, it works. <laughs> oh, it kind of, oh, okay. The foil creates so much turning force low down that it rolls too much in the turns. upside down. Oh, it steers really well. Look at that. <laughs> oh, I cannot believe that worked. That is so funny. Back in action. I'm done. <laughs> That's it. Oh, that was fun.